Eric uh, is an interesting guy. Uh, we met actually through the lectures, and uh, as we go on through the years here, I'm going to say, you know, I'm always going to connect Eric with World War I and the monuments. Uh, he lives down in Burlington County, so he may have traveled the furthest to get here, but I know there's some other people who may have traveled a bit. So let's give him the warmest, warmest of welcome. Uh, he's got a lot to say, and he will take questions at the end of the talk. Eric Burrow. Okay. I want to thank you all for coming out today and really being here in Hoboken, New Jersey is special for me because as a youngster, I used to visit my grandparents, not in Hoboken, but just across the river. They lived on West 72nd Street, and I'm old enough to remember the ferries that used to carry passenger cars across the river. So uh, it's kind of a nostalgic thing to be here in Hoboken. And he mentioned the three most important areas about Hoboken, but to me, uh, despite the fact I'm here talking about World War I, there was a fourth element as well, and that is the maritime history of Hoboken, which is kind of extraordinary because not only, of course, does it share with World War I history, but going back to the days of sail, uh, this was a port of embarkation and debarkation between uh, many immigrants in uh, the 19th century as well. And uh, it also was the home of the great yacht races of the America Cup. So Hoboken's a special square mile of space. And uh, when it comes to World War I, it's particularly special in the role that it played. And that role you see around you. Uh, so by all means, I see faces that I've seen here myself when I was sitting in the audience. But those of you who are new to Hoboken, by all means, take time. Look at the videos of uh, you know, the Leviathan and uh, our troops coming and going. Uh, there's no place else you're going to see this. And it's a big part of the story of Hoboken in World War I. Now, of course, why would anybody want to go out and photograph all the major monuments of New Jersey? Well, that's a good question. And the reason is because nobody else had done it. And secondly, I had a very strong feeling when I began to read about two years ago of the upcoming centennial celebration that officially began last year and will be ending this year, those two years marking America's participation in World War I, which had been going on for three years prior. We were late to the table, but we were to make a very big and essential difference in the outcome. Now, when it comes to World War I monuments, I'm starting specifically with Westfield, because in Westfield, this monument looks almost like a Civil War monument, except there's no soldier on top. Uh, those were usually with generals um, mounted on a horse. And of course, that's been kind of news lately in the South. I chose this one because this, for me, tells the whole story of what I'm going to be presenting. Because at the top of this monument, is the allegorical figure of Cleo. And Cleo, for those of us who we've forgotten um, the myths of the ancient Greeks, was the muse of history. And here is Cleo looking down on the world, watching us mortals continue to go to war. And in this case, at the base of, the, of this statue, at the base of the column, you will see detail showing all the participants who were allies at the time, including Japan and all of the uh, men from Westfield who died in the war. It stands by itself in a little triangle of land, and it's very prominent in town and everybody knows it. 
here's the detail that you'll you'll notice at the of all the participants. Now, when it came to monuments after the war, the big question was, what do we do? And when it comes to New Jersey, as you know, this is this town is very state is very prone to subdividing and subdividing to independent little independent little townships. Some of them are very small. And I don't mean, uh, I mean small in number, because after all, here we are in Hoboken, and it's a pretty good sized town, but in a small amount of space. And when it came to the state doing something after the war, well, that was up to everybody else to do. In this case, this is the capital, and both the combination of Mercer County and Trenton took until after 1930 to decide what they were going to do. The conversation nationwide was, will we build a monument in remembrance of those who died and those who participated? Those are two aspects that you will see recurring in the monuments that I'll show you. Or will we build something practical and make it a monument in remembrance, like a bridge or an auditorium, which in the case of Trenton is ultimately what they did. But it wasn't until like 1928 that they decided what it would be. And they continued to have coverage in Trenton about what every else, everyone else was doing. One of the most elegant monuments, understated, but using all aspects of artistic expression, is the one in Morristown. In Morristown, it is a cenotaph in the center. It reminds me of the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. It has plenty of space around it. It has standards for light poles and flag poles that are all done in individually, originally crafted in, in clay and cast in bronze. It's a magnificent space. And what makes it so central is that it's on a main street and it's right in front of a property that was owned by the last president of AT&T. So it used to be, it, after he died unexpectedly, he actually never lived there. He died unexpectedly and gave it to the town. He bequeathed it to the town. He didn't have a chance to do it personally. And the town used it as a town hall for many years. It's got an elegant interior to it. And most of all, it has a pair of bronze doors that are about 12 and a half feet high with the story of Morristown, going back to Jockey Hollow, and then the invention of the telegraph and so forth, all done by one of the sculptors that you saw upstairs. His name is Charles Keck. If you're ever in Morristown, it's well worth just having a walk around it. It's open space, it has a reflecting pool, it has large marble urns, at the side of it, it's, it's spectacular space. And if there was any place that would have been an appropriate remembrance for the state, this has that kind of level of class. Little slow on the take here. I said to you it has elements that are common uh, that some only have one portion or another. This, of course, has the, the Latin saying, dulce e decorum e pro patria morti, which means to give, to, one, to give your life to one's country is the sweet and wonderful thing. Notice the space. This is the wonderful bas relief uh, that's on the on the cenotaph, and these are the close-ups that you will see on the flagpoles 
it's absolutely a spectacular sight and well worth a visit. Now, when it comes to America's participation, remember we did not have a standing army. What you see is many monuments that pay tribute to the concept that we hearken back to the Minutemen, the citizen soldier, the man who worked in the field at one time and was called to provide service to his country, to defend his country, or to defend others. And this one in Irvington is an extraordinary Charles Keck statue in which you have, you don't see it, you only see the suggestion of it behind the doughboy. There's an open book on top of that open book is a lantern, you know, an oil lantern, and beneath it is a stump and uh, an axe, a pickaxe, showing that students and workers and tradespeople, all of them quite young, um, had been asked to serve their country, and here is one of them. A very idealistic picture. And by the way, that's also in a very small triangular piece of land. You probably would drive by this and never notice it. Um, it's a very busy thoroughfare, but it's dedicated to those who lost their lives in World War I, and years after, they have chiseled on the base to include other wars that America participated in. Now, upstairs, this statue is not shown. And the reason is, it's so big that I could only show you a part of it. There are over 40 individual life-size characters in this, and two horses life-size. This is done right in the center of Military Park. And I know every time I used to go to Newark, I was always in a hurry going somewhere else. And I never stopped to take a look at it until I started looking into World War I monuments. And this one is very unusual because there is a big storytelling element to this. It's called the Wars of America. And at the time this was commissioned, it was the last war that America had been in, which was World War I, but all the preceding wars as well. So when you look at the characters who are in this, you see a Washington type figure up here, but you see doughboys here this man with his hand in his pockets is obviously a conscientious objector being spoken to by a serviceman. At the back you will see um, people saying farewell to their loved ones going off to war. It's a very powerful statement and it was done by only one person that could do something on this scale, the very same artist who did Mount Rushmore. Oh, I went to, a little too quickly there. Also in Newark, before the uh, one that I just showed you, the one dedicated to over 20,000 servicemen that served from Newark is this monument. And it's done by Charles Niehaus, who lived not far from here in Cliffside Heights. He actually had a studio there, and this work trying to make it timeless, he took off the uniforms. And then to make it classic, he put on the accoutrements of uh, Roman military. And it, it was for many, many years neglected. But as you can see from the dark brown color, it has been refurbished. Uh, for many years it was scaling and green. Uh, but they never got to the 65-foot flagpole yet. But that's an amazing uh, figure. And because so many from Newark uh, had marched off to war, as I said, over 20,000, the list of names is in some way encapsulated 
inside the pedestal. Now, here is a monument on a grand scale. And when Montclair decided that they were going to commission Charles Keck to make this monument, I don't think they imagined how complex this monument would be. But as you will go through the others, you'll see that every time he approaches the question of a World War I monument, each one is so entirely different than its predecessor. This one shows, and it's only one of three monuments in New Jersey that represent sailors as well as soldiers. This one is showing a sailor here, as well as a doughboy, which you expect. And this is Columbia, who's behind them, prodding them on, encouraging them, giving them strength as they go off to battle. And what you can't see is on that shield, she's protecting them with the seal of the United States. This is, America is behind you. And high up on the top is another allegorical figure, and this is liberty at the top. Now, that in itself is pretty dramatic. But then, when you, if you can just notice right here, there's incising done. And there's actually a border that goes all the way around this pedestal. And insignias this size, at first I just thought, oh, that's a very interesting design device, until I realized it was every single company patch done in size that was represented in the war. I don't think a half a dozen people in that town have any idea that that artwork there represents all of the companies in the Navy and particularly in the Army that participated in the war. Up here are the names, along the shaft are the names of those uh, that per perished in the war uh, from that town. Now it's quite common, you know, when you're honest, there's something very gruesome about showing a soldier, you know, with a gas, uh, you know, protection and in front of him and carrying a rifle with a bayonet. And people didn't necessarily want to to be reminded about how grim modern warfare was. Uh, so what do you do when you want to remember those that participated? Well, allegorically, you like to go back to the honorable classic motif. And here's a, here's a flagpole that was a base for a flagpole in Plainfield, New Jersey, done by an Italian by the name of Cesare. And he decided to do a classical theme only. Well, that in itself wasn't controversial. But what was, is there's a saying around here, and the gist of it is similar to the sentiment of, thy weapon shall be given up into plowshares. You know, thy sword shall be converted to plowshares. And when the local, when this was dedicated, the local VFW and the American Legion both protested that they didn't want to participate in the dedication. They said, we gave up our lives and, you know, you shouldn't have that. And there was actually a tug of war, as to, forgive the expression, but there was great dissension and they went to city council and wanted to have it changed. And city council said, but this isn't even our land. The Presbyterian Church owns this little triangle of land and they have given the land and it's up to them. And they, they granted it to the town. So after a couple of years, the veterans finally showed up and participate there every year. Of course, there's nobody living that remembers the controversy. I'll get this button right. Now, the same artist also did an Art Deco figure, and I think she's absolutely beautiful. Uh, this is in Clifton, 
and it's a warrior entitled victory. And we'll see this theme coming up from time to time. Different ways of expressing victory. It's actually a less painful way of representing the war. And a third one that he had done, and by the way, I was at an exhibit not long ago where they were showing all the posters of war propaganda, and lo and behold, I saw his name at the bottom of one of them. But I can tell you, as a sculptor, he was much better. This is done in Princeton, and it's very low-key. It's a bench with an inscription about the World War I dead, And unfortunately, over time, the detail of this large medallion, which is in the center, is wearing away. Now, Princeton's a town with a lot of money, and you would have thought that they might have had something more akin to Montclair or something you'd have seen in Newark. I mean, after all, this town really had... It's certainly a remembrance that's honorable, but there was a reason why it's so low-key. And that is a monument, it's a World War I monument never intended to be a World War I monument. This monument is the monument to George Washington achieving success at the Battle of Princeton. So why would I say this is a World War I monument? Because of World War I, this was commissioned 14 years before it was dedicated. And the artist, Frederick McManus, was living in France, working on this monument. And the various characters and elements, as you can see, he's also got uh, some very large monuments in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And all of a sudden, the war is literally creating his house to shake and it's coming artillery barrages are not far off he lived not far from where Monet lived outside of Paris so he had to give up everything leave it behind and go back to New York now he also maintained a studio in New York but he hadn't started this project in New York he was doing it in France so to make a long story short what should have taken a few years, ended up taking 14 years, but Princeton, actually the curator at the Princeton Museum, who was his chief spokesman and sponsor, had the patience to just let it keep going, and he started over again here in America, and after the war was completed, he was able to put up this monument, which is only a a half a block away from the Cesare Monument for World War I. Now, that story, the reason I also included it, is Frederick McMahonies, after he had finally achieved this, it made the papers all over America, which of course is what Princeton had in mind. And down in Atlantic City, and of course also I should mention, although it's not a major monument, we all know Nassau Hall, But do you know inside Nassau Hall, when you go into the center pair of doors, it is, when these big heavy doors close behind you, you are in a memorial hall. It's the quietest, it's almost tomb-like. And here, along the wall, are all the names of World War dead that that had participated, both faculty and students of Princeton. So Princeton played a very big role in World War I, and we don't usually think of that. And Frederick McMahonies, who I was speaking about a couple of minutes ago, was asked after all this publicity about the monument in Princeton, the town fathers of Atlantic City, who now after the war were really generating lots of income for the city. Uh, They were doing civic works projects, revamping the streets. You know, after the war, everybody wanted to forget, and Atlantic City was symbolic of the fact 
that people were trying to get back to normal and here within a short distance of a train ride either on the Blue Comet from Jersey City or maybe uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad from Philadelphia within a short period of time you could be in Atlantic City and Atlantic City became a magnet either on a day trip basis or on a weekend or on a vacation basis so the town had lots of money and they had already in their civic project decided they were going to have at the southern entry to town route 30 um, they were going to build a Greek temple kind of as an anchor for a circle and then they realized right after the war well we can actually make this temple a World War I monument and if you, you kind of take your life in your hands going across three four lanes of traffic but you can actually walk to this and it is a park but you know it's a strange way to have to get to it around the crown and cornices of the building are all the major uh, battles that America participated in but they decided this was dedicated in 1922 they decided we should put something inside this guy McManus from New York he sounds like he might be a worthwhile uh, candidate so they called him down and they said we'd like to put a special monument we have the money we'd like to put something and he said I've been working for five years on one thing and if you like it I can upsize it for you he'd already created this I can upsize it for you do it in bronze and put it on a pedestal and it's there on green marble pedestal this is liberty in distress but it caused distress in Atlantic City a few years later they discovered they were reading a story about their famous statue was suddenly reproduced 65 feet high on the outskirts of Paris and this was what he'd always had in mind he wanted to do something gigantic as a way of showing what a francophile he was and he envisioned in his mind it would be America's gift to France just like earlier the Liberty uh, Statue of Liberty had been given as a gift from France well when Atlantic City heard this they they almost took him to court but finally suddenly it didn't happen they could have actually exploited it much to their own benefit but they uh, they were thinking like Atlantic City and <coughs> at the dedication of that and also the one in Princeton was the former Atlantic City mayor who would become also the governor of New Jersey and by the time in the middle 1920s he was uh, Governor Edge he was the ambassador to France and was also responsible uh, to participate here at what was the founding building of the American Legion in Paris it was to, supposed to be a, a special place for all Legionnaires to come to when they were visiting uh, Paris once again when it comes to being a soldier and that citizen soldier what could be more fitting than in Orange New Jersey you have a statue of a doughboy with his hat and his pack down on the ground he's actually holding a rifle and it's standing there right outside the former Lackawanna train station ready to go to Hoboken or Jersey City and one place that those who were fortunate enough to get together in the fall of this year we all went up and visited 13 sites here in Hudson County and in um, Bergen County and this site is a very important site and sadly the part you're seeing here is the part that's facing into what is a traffic circle so you actually to see this you have to get out go through walk through traffic uh, to see this marks this great obelisk and this art deco um, statue is marking the place that was the center point 
for the large Camp Merritt, which was the one stop where everybody who was going abroad stayed for about 10 days, were given their final uniforms, their outfits, their helmets, and then they either took the ferry or the train south to Hoboken. And here, here is Hoboken. And I hope, of course, you've had an opportunity to see this in the park. If you look at the base, and there's a picture at the very end, it shows two classical Greek birene prowls, ships coming and going. The wonderful thing about this magnificent statue done by the same man who did those nude soldiers in Newark is that it's, it's got a little girl in it and it, you know that this is homecoming, even though it's to mark both coming, uh, both going and coming. And, and even in the corner, there's a little bulldog. I'm sure he must have had an assistant that had worked at Yale. <laughs> okay, so moving right on. Here is one that's unlike any other doughboy anywhere in America. It's a doughboy who's holding one arm out. He's clutched, holding a flag, and the big words on the base of the pedestal say, hands off. Very difficult, a Frenchman. I couldn't find anything about him. Very little. He lived in Franklin Park, which is not far from Bloomingdale. And, and so I discover that he used to travel as an instructor back and forth to the University of Penn, where he worked for several years as an instructor. He had no other major works except um, characters that were inside some of the churches of Philadelphia and New York City. How, and also a couple of major buildings that had bas relief uh, across the front. Uh, the most notable one was at the uh, Board of Education in Philadelphia, where all these classical figures of teaching and the various sciences and uh, elements of learning. A marvelous thing. Other than that, I could find nothing about him. And then I discovered that he himself had been born in France and grown up in the years that were right after the Franco, um, the Franco-Prussian War, which meant that he saw the deprivation that existed on the outskirts of France, outskirts of Paris, and knew well ahead of time what war meant. And he had seen, grown up with deprivation because of a previous war in France with the Germans. So then finally I discovered some papers of his. He may well have been all his life, but most certainly later on in life, the attribute that you see here, not a pugnacious sword in hand or bayonet or a rifle, but just hands off. He had been very active as a Quaker. And so it seemed to make sense to me. But at first, when I saw it, I was quite puzzled by it. And the statue is always under trees. So this is the only time of day, about 7 o'clock in the morning, that you can illuminate it. Right here in Jersey, right next door in Jersey City. No one at Jersey City High School knows a thing about it. Oh, they know it's out there. They have no idea who did it. They don't know the story about it. But it's a fascinating story. This is, Carl Love is the same artist that did those, that group of doughboys that you can see in Manhattan, uh, just north of the uh, Metropolitan Museum in New York. And he, he himself had served as a captain in the military in World War I. And as a result, he has done other statues, including some at Paris Island and other bases around the country. Oh, the theme of this is called Carry On Dickinson. And of course, those of you who are local know Dickinson High School. 
by saying carry on Dickinson, if you look really carefully, and it's very difficult at this angle, there is behind these two doughboys the figure of a woman. It's alma mater encouraging them to move forward. It's a wonderful piece and very different from the uh, work that he did that was even more representational um, over in New York. And this is in the town where I am. This is in Burlington and this is the statue that got me started. I saw this statue, I passed it every day in Burlington, it's right on the main drag. It, like many other statues, and the one like Dickinson, was either in front of a high school or an elementary school, or adjacent to it, like in the case of Burlington, where the American Legion post is. I saw this and I said, I wonder how many other doughboys there are in New Jersey. And so I went to another town, something also in South Jersey, which I'll, you'll see in a minute, and I saw that, and then after going from my third to Atlantic City, I was smitten. <laughs> and I said, I have to know more. And boy, coming to North Jersey, I was rewarded. Also in North Jersey, a town that certainly saw glory days as a manufacturing hub that was world-renowned, and not so much these days, but at the time, right after World War I, Patterson still was in its glory days, and they went to a local sculptor, and here is um, Gaetano Federici, whose parents and brothers all lived in New York in the construction business, but he said, I want to be an artist. He moved to Patterson, and he never left. He d did hundreds of works in Patterson. He had a market for his work. Most of his work is still in Patterson. And this, done a little bit late for a World War I monument, because most of them were done in the early 20s or mid 20s. This one was later, and people were a little put off by the, the realism of it. This is a violent confrontation, and yet it is a marvelous piece and if you go, they have a studio of his uh, at Passaic County College. It's not his actual studio, but all the accoutrements of his, his trade and art are in this room. Locally in the paper, a lot of people uh, discredited it, but I think it's a marvelous work of art and certainly very realistic. This was the second one that I went to in my initial quest to discover what does New Jersey have regarding World War I monuments. When I saw this, I was almost convinced that, well, uh, certainly to go to Atlantic City. Why? Because I noticed in the back, unlike most, and I've been interested in sculpture since I was a youngster. In fact, the artist that uh, I first knew as a youngster was an artist by the name of Elwell, who was also a, um, a curator over at the Museum of Art in New York. Uh, he had a studio right over here in Hudson County, and he had done a statue of Charles Dickens that got international acclaim, but unfortunately nobody wanted to buy it. Even though it got all these gold medals on both sides of the Atlantic, so the city of Philadelphia ended up buying it and putting it in one of their parks where I live nearby. That statue was, was the reason Dickens' friendly people didn't want it, was Dickens was very specific in his writing and he said, I want no monuments or, or portraits made of me. And so all the people that love Dickens, they might have liked the statue, but oh, Dickens didn't want it. <laughs> so it still sits there in Clark Park in Philadelphia. Anyway, on that monument and most of the others, you'll see etched in the base of, of the statue uh, a name usually in very simple type. 
usually hand scratched, but on the back of this one, it was embellished. And I said, who is this person? He's so proud of this monument. And so I looked him up and I knew the, the sculptor indirectly because when I was a Boy Scout in Philadelphia, he is the one that had created the statue of the Boy Scout who's sort of standing like this and he's got an axe on his hip and he, it became the symbol of Boy Scouting in America. It's been duplicated thousands of times in different sizes and in artwork and on emblems. And his name was Mackenzie and he lived only blocks away, certainly before my time, from where I lived on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. He was, in fact, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania and not an art teacher. He was a full physician, but he wasn't a physician in the true sense of the word. He was head of the physical education department and did sculpture first as a study of how, how hu human bodies react to the stresses and of... Uh, of athletic events. And after that, he began doing figures. His first figure was a full-size Benjamin Franklin that you can see outside of, uh, of Franklin Field at the University of Pennsylvania. And he went on not only to make this for Woodbury, and I still haven't found out. This was a major commission. How did he end up with friends in Gloucester County? I mean, Gloucester County is not a big county, but here it sits right in front of a high school. The high school's about a third of a block behind it, and it's sandwiched between the post office and a bank on Broadway, the main drag of, uh, of Woodbury. He went on to make two other major works. He's done much more work than that, mostly in the field of athletics. And one is similar to this, in idea and in stance, and it's in Oxford, England. And the other one is a seated Scotsman, a Scotsman soldier, seated in uh, just across from the castle in Edinburgh. And it's a very famous statue where he not only did the, the central figure, but he also did a, a panorama of marching men like citizen soldiers and you're here in America where you see men from every trade and gradually they're transforming in the backdrop into, uh, as a bas relief, into soldiers in ranks. He also did where he really became famous internationally, which was never his intention. As I said, he was head of the physical education department. He created medals for athletic events, and he created, in 1912, the major medical that, uh, medal that was used for the Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden. So that is still emblazoned in Olympic Stadium in Stockholm today. So it, it's a, he was a man, an extraordinary man, with three separate careers simultaneously. And when the war came around, he went back to Canada, where he was from, and became an officer in reconstructive surgery uh, for the duration of the war uh, over in Great Britain, and then returned to Philadelphia. So he knew war and uh, the effects of war firsthand. This is a wonderful statue that's right up there in, Ed in Edgewater, not Edgewater, but uh, Englewood. And my roommate at college was from Englewood Cliffs. He, uh, I saw this statue at first. It was a, an overcast day, and I said, I've got to come back here. And I said, I think I've seen that statue before. And I remembered like three years before I happened to have been in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And there is a Civil War soldier standing out in front of the county, county courthouse in Westchester, Pennsylvania. But the stance and the flag all looked so similar. Sure enough, I went back to Westchester. It was exactly the same name. Now, he was originally um, from across the river over in Easton. But he moved to New Jersey and became a New Jersey sculptor. 
And there's another work of his upstairs that you'll see uh, that's showing a mother with two boys. Oh, that is also the only one that is illuminated at night. It's in a circle. Yes, you have to cross the street to be able to view the, the placards on the side. And it has also become an all-wars memorial. But it was originally dedicated as, as exclusively a World War I monument. But it is uh, lit up at night, like what you'd expect in, in Paris for monuments. Most of the other monuments do not get that treatment. This is one that is in a very emotional one, and those who were on the tour with me remember. I have visited this monument multiple times and could never get the light right. Why? Because he's facing north. And I was convinced after the second time I came, you know, I think this was truly intentional. Now, I discovered this same monument is actually out in Pennsylvania, and it's right in the middle of a square, and you lose the sense of what you feel, and I think others who were on the tour felt. And that was that it was positioned so you don't see the face. If you look closely, you'll notice that his clothes are all tattered, and he's... He's his stance is one of exhaustion. He's just returned from the battlefront. And even more, the impact of he's looking down from his high pedestal. And here he is way... Oops, oops sorry, I keep doing that. Right up here is the monument. And down the hill, a, a walkway that goes right to the edge of the park, you will see four, well, they're basically cenotaphs of a small size because you know for certain that the four who died uh, from Cliffside are not buried there, but it looks like they are. There are four separate monuments like this, and he's looking. There's two on this side and two on the other, and he's obviously lost his comrades. It's a very moving work. And if all you saw was the statue, you'd never come away with that sense of emotion that you feel when you end up interpreting it on site. And this one, I included it because this artist was primarily out in the Midwest. He did mostly work uh, on building projects uh, for Frank Lloyd Wright, but uh, someone decided that he would be a good candidate and he said yes to doing a doughboy for Haddon Township. And he created this little work of art that has been moved once since it was originally placed in front of a school, now it's in front of a firehouse. And it's actually not full size. But it's a wonderful piece with action, and it's one of the few that uh, Karl Bach has done. I included it here because it's one of a kind. And speaking of one of a kind, this, without a doubt, is not a monument to America, Native Americans, even though it looks like it would be an appropriate one for that. This was done by a Camden artist who came as an immigrant to America and rarely had an opportunity or the funds as he raised his family in Camden um, to do full-time commissions. However, he was acting as an instructor. He even created a, uh, the Camden uh, uh, Art Academy uh, during the WPA he was an instructor but this is the largest piece that he had ever done and he did it for a society that's like the moose or the elks a social benevolent organization this one's name the Society of the Red Men and it was extremely popular back around the same time when granges were popular throughout America as kind of a local, as I said, benevolent, a do-good organization locally to help. 
they were extremely patriotic and they were also uh, benefactors to children's causes. And there are still, I don't think uh, the one in Tuckerton is still in existence any longer, there are some still elsewhere in America. And this was done as a tribute to the Society of the Redmen who all served in the military and some lost their lives. And on this placard that's in front is a listing of those that participated in the war from their respective lodges. And the lodges, interestingly, are each named after tribes in America. They viewed Native American society as something that they could learn from, the, the honorable aspects of the outdoors and, and Native American culture. It was, uh, you might say, a halfway direction of understanding and appreciating something that everyone else had just discarded as meaningless. So it's a, a fascinating story, and it was standing in a park and getting vandalized all the time. Right now, the School of Dentistry and Medicine in Camden is where it had been. And it was moved to Tuckerton, New Jersey, this, about a half a block from the uh, uh, Seaport Museum, because the last remaining New Jersey, or one of the last two remaining New Jersey lodges of the Red Men Society was in Tuckerton. This one, I only included it because it tells two stories. This is the most popular World War I doughboy you'll see in the country. It was done in the hundreds. You could buy, in fact, there were ads after the war of, you need a monument in your town? Just call him E.M. Viskesny and he will be happy to send you one for $795. And your option is how you make the pedestal. And because of that inexpensive price, and compared to anything that was done, either originated or anything duplicated in bronze, it was a steal. And many towns thought that this was a very expedient way of remembering World War I. So it, it has a, a story all its own as to how it proliferated around America. Uh, the second reason I included it here, as well refurbished as this statue in Belmar is, what happened to it recently is something that has been happening to World War monu One monuments and other monuments as well. Public art is often desecrated or vandalized, or in one case, completely t taken away and for scrap, unexpectedly. So uh, hopefully the $15,000 that's needed, the mayor has gotten an estimate of replacing the hand and the rifle and the bayonet, and it will be restored. <laughs> I also have only a few representations here. There are quite a few around the state what was the second most common uh, distribution of um, statuary monuments are those that are either um, made of granite um, and they were literally selected out of a catalog and the major manufacturers were in New Hampshire. This one is somewhat unique in that it relates to two other figures that were placed precedingly in Red Bank one is um, Spanish-American War and the one in the center uh, holding the flag down to the others as a Civil War officer. So this is unusual in the fact that it's a three-war representation of memorial with separate plaques in front. And this one was specifically made to honor those from Red Bank for World War I. And there's another one here.
that everyone, it's bizarre. I go all over the state and people say, did you get the Doughboy in Highland Park? I don't know what, it's, it, he's, he's one of many that look like this, but for some reason maybe people were at Rutgers and they crossed the bridge and went past this. This one seems to be in everybody's memory. I have more people ask, D- you did get the one in Highland Park, didn't you? And yes, I did. And this one, which is also a catalog figure, is the only one in the state that is part of a memorial for one individual. This is in the cemetery in Colophon, New Jersey, and uh, near Long Valley area. Now, this is typical of monument makers of the time. Uh, In this case, We don't know who the artist was. It was a manufacturer that didn't have any obligation to the artist and made multiples, but nowhere on the scale of Visquesne. And this is another one from Jersey City. And there's one in Verona that looks just like it. This is an artist that was very busy after the war. His name is Pietro Montana and he did some marvelous work over in Brooklyn. And this particular one, there are four copies that were made. Two in bronze, two in zinc. Of the two in zinc, um, one has completely disintegrated, obviously a less durable material, and the second one is sort of hanging in there. Two that were in bronze are signed by him. The two in zinc, I think the manufacturer did on the side, or maybe he owned, owed the foundry money and they said, well, let us make some copies and pick up the tab on the foundry bill. The cost of the foundry to the artist was the biggest single cost in making a monument. And this is the other one in Wenaki. In Union City, which used to be Northern Hoboken, uh, here is another monument. And it's amazing, on the tour, this little monument that's tucked into a corner as you kind of go up the palisade from Edgewater, this one appealed to everybody. They just wanted to hang out by this. And I think the characters are kind of whimsical. And I fully believe, I want to believe that in the background, oh, there I go again. In the background, back here, right there, that looks very much like the USS New Jersey. And yes, in World War I, there was a USS New Jersey. And in Elizabeth, you will find the original bell from the USS New Jersey. (laughs) But that's all that's left. I'm sure many of you have heard of Billy Mitchell, who was the flyboy, the officer uh, from World War I, um, probably as famous, maybe a little infamous. Um, after the war, he said, World War I has already proven the importance of an air arm, and he wanted America to be more prepared for whenever the next war might arise. And to prove a point, By this time, uh, the SS New Jersey, which during the war was only used for training purposes because it was part of the original white fleet of Teddy Roosevelt's day, uh, he proved that a single airplane could sink a battleship. And no one in the military believed it, least of all the admirals, until he did it. And the ship he sunk was the SS New Jersey (laughs) off the coast of Virginia. And of course, we're almost home again. Here's Weehawk in New Jersey. And I've included this because it's only one of three monuments that show the importance of sailors in the struggle against Germany. Because without the sailors and the effort of uh, keeping away uh, the U-boats, which were the big threat to our transports, we may never have made as many men reaching France as had been possible. 
This is actually back-to-back figures, larger than life. You have, of course, here... uh, Here, the the sailor, and here, the doughboy. What I'd like to point out is the detail on this eagle is fantastic. And what I also... uh, feel very good about. When I when you look at World War I monuments, they're frequently standing apart from everything else, often some corner in a park. This one, people are ambling by it every day. I've watched brides with their new husbands having wedding pictures here. I see kids playing and I say, you know, the doughboys would approve, you know, to be able to see normal American life taking place and at this location and the view of Manhattan is spectacular. And this is another one that's from a catalog. And this is a mystery. One of many mysteries I've come across. No one can tell me where Ridgefield's Doughboy was made. They don't know the manufacturer. They don't know who the artist was. It's still a question mark. One day we'll find out. What makes it unusual is that it's sitting on top of something that North Jersey has a lot of that I don't see in South Jersey. Big boulders. And this boulder is probably about 300 tons. I mean, he's, he's up about this high, right in the center of the boulder, so you can't get very close to him. And this one, I want you to go visit yourself. It's in Kearney. And General Pershing was there when they dedicated it. And it's the front part is an allegorical figure. It's a benediction, a figure representing benediction, saying farewell to the departed soldiers. And in that sense, it's typical of a war memorial and a farewell. However, also on it are three sides behind the benediction figure and the tall uh, obelisk type pillar. These are two of the three tableaus. One, if you look carefully, you'll see trench warfare being represented and what the men on the Western Front had to confront. Another one of a naval engagement between a destroyer and a U-boat. Notice there's Leviathan sailing by. And the other side is of an aerial dogfight between German and American pilots. And this one, which is from Doylestown, Pennsylvania, But I included it because it was a South Jersey artist, always had been and continued to be to his final days. He lived in Haddonfield, New Jersey. His last name, Bateman, is a name that it was locally associated with the oystering business in um, Delaware Bay. But uh, he went off to uh, an academy and learned the, the skills of an artist and then it becoming a prominent instructor and he was also head of the sesquicentennial artwork that was being done in Philadelphia back when Philadelphia had that major exhibition and this is unusual in that it shows a very human side of the war experience in France and this I only included it because it's local it's nearby It's kind of an awkward monument. Uh, It's trying to be a pyramid. Um, It's kind of a design that wasn't quite sure which way it wanted to go, but it's an important monument, and each individual from West New York that died is shown here on each of these nameplates. And what I liked about it are the caricatures that are right in here of these, of these figures. Uh, they were made, uh, I think this may have been done as a WPA project, but it, it's a wonderful piece from that standpoint.
Now, East Orange. And if I were to make a campaign today for Save a Statue, this is one that's not really being threatened, but it's in the wrong place. I don't mean East Orange itself, which is, like many areas, has gone through transition. But what I mean is it's right in the middle of a playground, and nobody seems to care about it. And the flag that flies never gets taken down, and it's in tatters. And there's graffiti on the, uh, on the pedestal. Uh, I tried my best to avoid it, but it's there. But it's an elegant statue. Here is a victory figure done by Charles Keck, another Charles Keck original. The detail, the lettering, is all individually lettered in clay originally, although this is now a bronze. And the detail of the flag, it's an extraordinary figure. In this playground, the playground is behind the free library. In my view, money should be campaigned for to put this monument in front of the library where it will tell its story much better because out here it's a forgotten masterpiece. And speaking of classical masterpieces, this is one that you'll find in East Rutherford and it's another view of victory and it's marvelously detailed and the interesting thing about the creator, a father and son team, is that they were the master sculptors that helped other sculptors. Let me explain. They had a place in Manhattan that they built specifically to ha be surrounded by glass to be used as a multiple three tier, four tiered high building exclusively for artists doing sculpture. And so about four or five of the names that you see upstairs at one time or other resided in this place in lower Manhattan. They were the ones that did the upsizing and reproportioning for artists that had made an original creation. But they had also done work of their own, but that was a sideline to them. And this was a father and son's work. Their grandfather was a Hungarian who'd come to this country, and you can find a Native American head that he did that was of an Indian chief that's at, uh, in, in Hackensack. But he lived out in Princeton, and every day he would go back and forth uh, to his studio down in lower Manhattan and he owned a sizable chunk of real estate in Princeton and he used it as an atelier for many years so that he probably got a lot of students to work for him for next to nothing out there and it was kind of a predecessor have any of you been to Grounds for Sculpture? Well it's very much like the predecessor of grounds for sculpture when their atelier was primarily a place for other artists to come and further their trade through assistance and uh, apprenticeship. And this one on Jersey City. It's an interesting story about when this was dedicated when the artist wasn't there. In fact, the artist isn't even mentioned when the New York Times writes about it. But locally, they talk all about the pilot who flew the open biplane that flew around for two hours. I'm surprised he didn't have to refuel. And one at a time threw a single red rose over down to the park, to Pershing Park, and then made another round. So for two hours, this went on until all of the roses had been thrown down. They were clumped up and placed at the base of this monument which is standing on top of a very large boulder. The park has uh, the, the former facade of the old armory of, New, of Jersey City which was erected about 1930, about 10 years after the dedication. The site, this 
despite the fact that you have the names listed here on the shield of this magnificent allegorical figure, there are also the names of individual soldiers on small stones along the walkway, which we got to see when we visited it on the tour. And this in Belleville, has a wonderful French name, uh, is placed right in front of City Hall, and it is in need of refurbishment, but I'm told that they're working on it. Another viewpoint of victory. And here is America. And the one, the artist that you saw who did those two fighting doughboys, uh, one with a 45 and the other with an Enfield rifle, this was the work that he did, did for another section of Patterson uh, that's in the park. And it has uh, it's seen better days, but that picture you saw at the very beginning of today's talk, uh, the soldier, the nurse, the marine, and the sailor in the opening slide, this is actually at, uh, along the base of this, and this is in dire need of uh, reparation. And Charles Keck proved that he could not only do bronzes, but this is made from granite. And this is in Little Falls. And on the flip side of this monument are all the names. And right down the center of two columns of names is a, a very ancient sword with a large hilt on it. It's, it's magnificent. Now. There are women sculptors also doing works in New Jersey, and this is one of them. Uh, Edith Barreto had done this, and what's remarkable about it is that not only did she do this angelic figure, but on the pedestal, she did these ba this bas-relief. This is on the front, and these are on the side of the pedestal, showing different aspects of the Doughboy experience. It's a very nice work, and it's beautifully maintained, and the, the park setting is marvelous. Now, another woman who is also the, the wife of a very, very famous New York sculptor. She was known for doing animals of all types, and here in New Jersey, she has two elk. Why elk? Well. This Elk Lodge was one of the larger ones in New Jersey, and this is specifically a memorial to all those in New Jersey who were Elks that served. And this one, which is an orange, is specific to the one Elk that was known to have died in World War I. His name, ironically, was Hart. And, uh, this is outside of the local Orange Elks Club. By the way, the Elks Club here in Hoboken, they were big sponsors of, uh, of supporting the monument that you see in the park. This just shows the variation of other types of monuments. It's actually done by the brother who was an architect of William Carlos Williams, who was a famous New Jersey uh, poet. And we segue from that to this. We, we've been talking all about soldiers and sailors, but what about the price that was paid for mothers? And mothers are remembered. We don't have in New Jersey anything like this monument that's a tribute to mothers, and it was commissioned by mothers. All Gold Star mothers in Philadelphia commissioned this, and this is by Rawl, who was the same artist that did the uh, memorial in Englewood. And this one is something from New Jersey for Gold Star mothers, and it's the Gold Star Monument in Union City. Very simple. So here we bring ourselves back to Hoboken. And I hope that that gives you a good perspective, just a slight overview. 
But there's just, as they say, or Steve Jobs used to say, one more thing. Well, it's not over. I know it was years ago that these World War I monuments were completed. And yet I'm going to show you two that were done in this past year, specific to World War I. This one, what a surprise for me. I came a week later. Nobody invited me to the dedication. I would have loved to have been there. But I come across this just outside of Tom's River. And it's a World War I doughboy. Not mentioning the doughboy that you discovered, that we have no idea when that was made in Lambertville. <laughs> um, this one was made and completed last year. It's part of a grouping of different period soldiers. They're remembering all of America's past modern warfare from the Civil War forward. In other words, the Spanish-American War, for World War I, World War II, and so forth. So the soldiers are all separate, but what a surprise for me to discover that suddenly we have the last doughboy in New Jersey in Tom's River. And in my county of Burlington County, the county itself, paid for by private funding, not the county, but to remember the county participants in World War I, this was just completed a couple of months ago and, and uh, erected in Medford, New Jersey. So here we are. Looking back over the monuments of New Jersey. And yet, we have a monument that you saw upstairs that many of you had no idea what it was. Well, the story behind it is still revealing itself ever so gradually. And that is, this monument was never designed for here. This monument was designed for Verdun, France. This monument is one of what was envisioned as over 200 monuments that would be placed periodically at the local sites from the North Sea to Switzerland along the front where the Germans were held back. How did it end up here? Well, the Historical Society of Ocean County said, oh, well, the land was owned by John Wanamaker and he bought it. But that oversimplification doesn't cut it. I personally have a theory which I'll share with you, but I think it's even deeper than that. The son of John Wanamaker, Rodman Wanamaker, was a big advocate for the arts, both here in America and in France. He'd lived in France for about 10 years. He was living as a contemporary of the artist that created these. I'm looking for that link. And I will share it with you when I get that verification. But I think that that project, which was originally between Rodman Wanamaker, in my view, between the artist and the touring automobile touring clubs of France and Belgium who did all the legwork in distribution and helped finance it. I think behind the scenes was Rodman Wanamaker. So I'm working on that and we'll let you know. Also in Princeton, unfinished business. Princeton actually had a school that was designed to train pilots to fly. And they weren't the students that were in the school at the time. They were from graduates from other colleges. 47 of them that went to that school died in France. When I gave the talk in Morristown, they had the names of those from Morristown who had died, and I discovered one of them had gone to this school. Well, I had just discovered this monument, which most people at the university don't even know about. It was resurrected from the basement of Nassau Hall in 2008. His name is not on it. So I hope to be able to report to you in the future that this year, maybe we can get his name, the, the unlisted 
flyboy that learned in Princeton on this monument. And there's other unfinished business. There, there is right now a campaign throughout America to help support the diminishing and failing sites of memorials around the country. The American or United States Centennial Commission has put forward grant money to uh, grant to a hundred monuments that need help in reestablishing them, either refurbishing them, some need drastic repair. New Jersey monuments have individually applied. My town was the first one of a statue to be granted, and three other towns, uh, Montgomery, excuse me, uh, Cape May, uh, <laughs> Cape May, uh, Burlington, and two others were named as winners of that grant. And hopefully next year another 50 will be named, and I hope more of New Jersey will be winners for that since there is a great need to do so. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your coming today.